Today we're going to talk about seizing the opportunity in life. The Lord Jesus Christ, as he's preaching in a, one particular sermon, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Pastor Dan's teaching on this on Wednesday nights. It's called the greatest sermon by the greatest preacher who ever preached. Um, the Lord Jesus Christ talks to us really about how we do invest our time in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. How do I invest my time? How do I bring about change? How do I seize the opportunity? How do I take the risk and, and really live it out? Because time does march on and time never stops and there's nothing that we can ever do to slow it down. And so the Lord Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5 in verse number 13 that you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people put a light, uh, put a light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And so the Lord Jesus here uses two metaphors, and I believe these metaphors can be used in reference to seizing opportunity and to investing our time wisely. You know, what did Jesus mean by these metaphors about salt, and, and what did he mean about these metaphors about light? Well, there's a couple of things that we know about salt. Salt is, uh, is used to preserve, and it, is, uh, it prevents uh, decay, it prevents putrefaction. And light, light ch chases the darkness out. For instance, if we were to turn off the, light in this the lights in this room, it would grow dark in here. But if I were to light just a single match and hold it on the stage, it would so chase darkness away that you'd be able to see the light from that match all over the room, although it's just a very, very small flame. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is talking to us about being salt. He's talking to us about being a people who help preserve a society, who help prevent the decay, the putrefaction of a society, and being a people who shine light so as to chase the darkness of lies away. So when he talks about salt, this is what Jesus is saying. Salt, live in such a way that it makes people thirst for God. And light, shine God's grace and compassion into the dark areas of despair. You know, this could be one of the most important things for us to discover and for us to incorporate and to assimilate into our lives. It's that whole idea of salt. To live in such a way so as to make people thirst for God and light, to shine the, the light of God's grace and compassion into the dark areas of despair. So, you know, if, if you were saying your last words... And you had that one last thing to say, that one last piece of encouragement, that one last piece of wisdom to share with somebody, what would it be? I think that perhaps for us and for me and for what I'd like to talk about today, it would be be strong salt, be great salt, and be a bright light. And in order to be stronger salt, in order to be greater salt, in order to be brighter light, there are about four steps that we can take along the way as we seize the opportunity, as we live out our lives. Lee Strobel, the author of The Case for Faith and The Case for Christ, before he came to Christ, he was an atheist. He was the legal writer for the Chicago Tribune. He was in the criminal court system one day, and a guy walked into the door by the name of Ron, and it's in his book, The Case for Faith. And he turned everything upside down. He says, let me tell you the story of Ron. And now, before I launch into that story, I want to remind you of something we've been hitting every week. God is preparing you for what he has prepared for you. Okay, so I want you to remember that as we go through the story 
of Ron from the case for faith. Ron was the second in command of the Bel Air Street Gang. The Bel Air Street Gang dominated Chicago in the 1970s. They were a ruthless band of terrorists in the community. Ron was a sociopath. He was first taken to juvenile court when he was nine years old, and and that was when he took a hammer and threw it at his mother's head. He became a drug dealer. He was just a bad guy. So one day he went hunting for a member of a rival street gang. He saw the brother of that guy uh, from that other gang who had beat up one of his friends. So Ron took out a gun and he starts chasing the guy down the street in Chicago, shooting him. And he shoots him in the back, right there on the streets of Chicago. And this guy falls face down on the sidewalk, and Ron catches up with him, and he turns him over. And the guy is begging for his life, don't shoot me, please don't shoot me, don't shoot me. And he says, without an ounce of compassion, Ron took the gun, put it to the guy's face, and pulled the trigger. Click. It was out of bullets. Then he hears a siren in the distance. He thinks certainly the police are coming to get him and he's going to be caught. And since he's tried to to kill this guy, it's attempted murder, he's looking at 20 years in prison. So Ron runs. He gets his girlfriend and they go to Canada. A few years later, they come back to the United States and they settle in Portland, Oregon. He, He got his first legitimate job in his life working in a metal fabricating plant, working on metal. And the people that owned that business were Christians who were, according to Strobel, like salt and light. They shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with Ron, and Ron realized that he was a terrible sinner who needed forgiveness through Christ. He repented of his sins, he received Jesus Christ, and his life was radically transformed. Ron became a model employee of that company. He married his girlfriend. They had a cute little girl by the name of Olivia. He became a pillar in his church. He would be the guy who would visit you in the hospital to pray with you uh, that came from the church. He, he uh, He would tell people about Jesus wherever he went. He was highly, highly regarded in his community in Portland, Oregon. And the police had stopped looking for him. They were just glad they couldn't find him in Chicago. They didn't care. He could have lived the rest of his life and nobody would have ever known. But one day he said to himself, well, wait a second. I've been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, but I've not been reconciled with society. There's still a warrant out for my arrest for attempted murder. And I'm living a lie. And I can't do that as a Christian. So he kissed his wife and daughter goodbye, knowing he was going to face 20 years in prison. And he got on a train, and he went to Chicago, and he walked into a courtroom. Strobel says, if you've ever been in a criminal court, you know that it's full of people who are trying to evade responsibility for what they've done. They're trying to find a loophole to get out of what they've done. Nobody wants to be held accountable for the crimes they've committed. Now remember, Strobel's an atheist reporter for the Tribune. And Ron walks in and blows everybody away because he stands up before the judge, and this is what he says in effect. I'm guilty. I did it. I shot the guy in the back, and I intended to kill him. If I have to go to prison, I understand. But I'm a Christian now, and I believe the right thing for me to do is to admit what I did and and to tell you that I'm sorry. So what I did was wrong, and I'm sorry I did it, but I am yours. Strobel, the atheist reporter, he is in absolute shock. You know, people, they don't do that. He was stunned, uh, you know, by this. And, And in a way, he says he was attracted to this as an atheist. He was attracted to the faith. You know why? He said, because we live in times where the moral foundation has been chipped away. When the national model might as well be, take the easy way out. And when somebody does something, not because it's easy, but because it's, or, and because it's convenient, but because it's right, that attracts people toward their faith. 
It causes people to respect them for the depth of their faith and has transformed their values and their character. So Strobel was so in- intrigued with Ron that he didn't even have to come over to, to tell him about Jesus. Strobel went up to, to Ron and asked him, tell me your story. Tell me what happened. Well, tell me what prompted you. And he said, when he told me how Jesus Christ had radically transformed him, he had my complete attention and he had a special credibility. So grab a hold of this. So if you want to know what it means to be stronger light, in other words, to seize the opportunity, what it means to be brighter light, to seize the opportunity, one of the things it means is we need to live out our faith even when we have to pay a price to do it. Now what does that mean for you? I don't know. It may be in your business uh, profession that your boss is asking you to cross a moral and an ethical line and, and you have to pay the price and say, I can't do that. As a follower of Jesus Christ, I can't do that. It might mean as a business owner, you know, you, you have to make room for life. You've got to seize the opportunity that you have with your kids and with your maid and, and, and with your friends and, and with your church. It may mean you pay a social price. You may be at some kind of a party and they're ragging on Christians and you step in and say, let me tell you the other side of it. I don't know exactly what that means, but this is what I do know. It's when you're so changed by Jesus Christ, it causes you to take steps and to do things that are right even though they're not convenient, that will be like salt that's savory and points people to Jesus because they're watching. The Apostle Paul wrote to the people in Galatia in chapter 6 and said, Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Peter, the apostle, wrote and said, Therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. The next day, Ron was sentenced. And, he judged, and the judge had read Strobel's article. And the judge looked at Ron, and this is what the judge said. He said, Ron, with your background, with your criminal record, and you shooting this guy in the back and tried to shoot him in the face, you deserve 20 years in prison. But I believe you're a changed man, and I no longer believe you're a danger, so here is my sentence. I sentence you to go home and be with your wife and your little girl. And he let him go. That's incredible. That's really an incredible story, but it's, imagine what happens when we learn to take the risk and seize the opportunities and live as stronger salt and greater salt and brighter light than we've ever been before. God can work in our lives and God can work through our lives and God can do the things that only God can do. He can provide the miracles and do the miracles of transformation. Ron's a true story. and You know where you can find Ron this morning? You can find him in his church in the Northwest. He's now a pastor. And he leads that church Sunday after Sunday. So to be stronger light and to be brighter light, it means that that, we live out our faith even when we have to uh, perhaps pay a price. And that's what Ron did. But the second thing it means is, is that we pray. It means that we pray for people as though their life depends upon it. Because it does. In Luke chapter 23, the Lord Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If you know what's going on there, Jesus Christ is hanging on the cross. John Stott, the British pastor and and writer of commentary, said, Do you realize that the prayers of Jesus Christ for the spiritually lost people continued right up until his final gasp on the cross? That when you read the New Testament account of the crucifixion of Jesus in the original Greek language in which it was written, one of the things that you notice is the imperfect tense of the Greek that suggests that Jesus did not say it just once, but he kept repeating it all through the torture of the crucifixion. While the nails were being driven into his hands, and while the nails were being driven into his feet, All through the torture of the crucifixion, he kept praying. He kept praying, Father, 
forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So Jesus, you know what? He prayed for people that were so spiritually depraved that they crucified and they tortured to death the Son of God. And his prayers continued until his final gasp on the cross. And so, if I'm going to seize opportunity, if I'm going to be stronger salt, greater salt, brighter light, I've got to pray for people as though their life depends on it. On Wednesday night, I also teach a class that's called Awake, and it's about having a, a spiritual awakening in our lives. And this past Wednesday night, we were studying on prayer. And we're talking about the events of our culture and our world and our politicians and all those different kinds of things. And I was trying to point us, you know, that we pray. We pray for ourselves. We pray for our church. We pray for our nation. Somebody in my class said, I can't pray for that man, talking about the president. I said, wait a minute, you don't have any choice. You don't have any choice. Well, I'm not going to do it. And I just bluntly said right there in the Bible study, well, you're disobeying God. And you are. You see, in James... James, the brother of Jesus, said the effective prayer of a righteous person accomplishes much. The righteous prayer of a of a, of a righteous the, the, the effective prayer of a righteous person accomplishes much. And I just happen to believe that we're to pray fervently for people's lives because they depend on it. We need to pray that the light of the gospel will dawn in their life. We need to pray that their hearts will be tenderized and and receptive to that gospel message. We need to pray for that missionary who's taking it to them or that preacher that's preaching it or that friend that's witnessing. We've got to pray as though their lives depend upon it because they do. A third thing we do is we help people get past the spiritual sticking points in their life. Boy, there's a lot of those too, let me tell you. You know, so many people that we know, friends, kids, grandkids, aunts and uncles, man, they've got questions about Christianity. You know, when I was a a young um, sergeant in the Air Force, I had this guy walk up to me and ask me one day, he said, what is it that's different about you than everybody else? Now, I'd been praying for God to let me be great salt and great light, right? What is it that's different? But he, all, he had all these questions about Christianity. And, and, and people sometimes, they express doubts about faith. And they have these objections. And there's something that holds them back. And, and we've got a word for how we're to respond to people in our church. You know, we've got three things that we do. We love God. That's about how we worship God. And, and we bring hope. That's how we carry this great news of Jesus Christ to the world that's around us. But that middle word is, is that we be real. And it's about being authentic. It's about understanding where people are. Understanding that it's okay to have questions. It's okay to have doubts. It's okay to have objections. Jesus was never afraid of anybody with doubts and with questions and objections. And neither should we be. Because understand, God is preparing you for what He has prepared for you. You know, you've gone through nothing in your life, nothing in your life that God will not use in the next step. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans that, but God causes all things to work for good to those who love Him and that are called according to His purpose. What does that mean? It means that not everything that's happened in my life has been good. Man, when I was a kid and fell on a piece of glass and cut my hand open and had a three and a half hour surgery to put it all back together, that was not good. I, I hated glass. I remember riding the hospital, man. My, my, my hand is just shooting blood, right? And I'm saying, I hate whoever invented glass. It was not good. But you see, God turns that and He uses that. 
He uses those experiences so I can identify with those who are going through trauma and going through pain. He uses those heartaches that come our way that we can identify with those who who have heartache. He uses everything in our life. He prepares us for what He has prepared for us. And if we're praying for other people as if their life depends upon it, then we're learning how to to, to be real with them and to handle, handle their doubts and their objections and their questions. You know, questions are legitimate, and doubts are natural. You know, you think of all the people who were around Jesus. John the Baptist would be the staunchest supporter, right? Remember, you know, John's the one who baptized him. He's the cousin that jumped in his own mother's womb when Mary came to visit. And John says in John 1.29, the next day Jesus coming toward him said, he didn't say, hey, this, this might be the Christ. Hey, it, it, he may be it. This is what he said. He said, behold, it is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Man, you've got this guy living in the wilderness. He's eating locusts and wild honey and camel hair for clothing. And, and you hear him cry out. He's recognized as a prophet. Behold, the Lamb of God. You know, he's got people's attention. And he baptizes Jesus, and he sees the heavens open up. And and in verse 32 and 34, it says, John bore witness, and he said, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove and remained on him. With my own eyes, I saw the Spirit as a dove descend from heaven and, and rest on him. And I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. He heard the voice of the Father in Matthew This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But then John the Baptist gets arrested and taken to prison. And some things begin to happen to him that happens many times in many of our lives. You know, when everything is good, it's easy. Praise Jesus, hallelujah, jump up and down, love the Lord. But man, when, when, the, when the stuff hits the fan, it's easy to go into what's been termed bouts of doubt. God, are you real? Is this whole thing just a farce? Do you care about me? Do you know what's going on in my life? Bouts of doubt. And so he sends a couple of guys to talk to Jesus, and he wants his question answered. He says, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Man, he has some major doubt going on, right? And so Jesus responds in Luke chapter 7 and answers and says, Go tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind, you know, they receive their sight. The lame, they walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have good news preached to them. And essentially, this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, seize the opportunity, right? You know, seize this opportunity, the opportunity about, you know, uh, living out your faith. Seize this opportunity about praying for others as if their life depends upon it. Seize the opportunity of answering the doubts. And, and, and he says, go back and speak the evidence that you have experienced that has convinced you that I am the one. Speak the evidence that has convinced you. You know, for many years in the church, we've tried all these different tools to help us be able to speak the evidence. When I was going through seminary, here was the big deal. Evangelism Explosion. Evangelism Explosion was written by uh, D. James Kennedy, the pastor of um, Coral Gables, uh, somewhere down south. You know, Dr. Kennedy died and went to be with the Lord. Bless him. But he had written that. And so everybody had to memorize Evangelism Explosion, but I took a professor that didn't require that. I took Dr. Roy Fish who just required me to memorize the New Testament. 
And after seminary, I remember this thing came out called CWT, Continuing Witness Training. I even got certified in CWT. I memorized every dot and every period. I was a pastor facilitator of it. I put it on my resume. <laughs> CWT. Resume if you're slow. Okay? And it was all these systems. And, you know, systems may be okay, but Jesus isn't saying go and share four spiritual laws. He's not saying go and, and share CWT or EE or anything else. Jesus is saying just tell people what happened to you. Just tell people what happened to you. Boy, that's pretty easy, isn't it? Really? Tell, them what you, tell people what you've seen, what you've heard, what you've experienced. Tell other people what happened to you. You know, Jesus, after this incident with John, he later says, you know, he, he gets up before a group and says, among those born of women, there's no one greater than John. John the doubter, John with questions. And you're going to have questions and doubts along the way too. But as a follower of Jesus Christ, one thing we need to know is it's okay to have a question. It's okay to have a doubt. And as long as we do what John does and we confront those questions and doubts. Because the longer I live, the more I'm convinced I'm going to doubt faith from time to time. Hello? Anybody been there with me? You know? But you confront and you go back to Jesus and say, show me the reality. Peter wrote and said, in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that's in you. And do it with gentleness and with respect. You know, just sharing life. Now, Pastor Dan's probably done a better job explaining this than what I can do, but we're starting a ministry out of our church. It's called Missional Community, Missional Community Groups. Okay? You know what it's about? It's about getting together in smaller groups, in our homes, living in community, living out our faith, and sharing it with others. Is that it in a nutshell, Dan? You know, we've got to be missional. We've got to tell these other people. Now, I think that um, James may have been overly optimistic when he said there's 500 people here this morning. You know, I don't think there's, we've got quite 500. That means there's over 11,000, almost 12,000 people out there that maybe not be in church, that live in this community. You know, the church has got to be missional. It's got to tell the story of Jesus Christ. And finally, let me wrap it up and say this. We have to risk it spiritually and extend grace to others. G, uh, Paul wrote and said, Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of time. The NLT version says, Live wisely among those who are not believers. You know, how do you do that? Well, I don't know how you do it, but there's ways that I, we're all supposed to do it. You know, last Sunday I told you the story about a, uh, an opportunity that maybe I missed out on. Remember the story I told you about the lady with the three kids and Sam's in the cart and how I'd chosen the wrong line of people to get in with? And then my wife asked me after the Sunday morning service, she said, well, you did buy groceries. You did buy our groceries, didn't you? Of course not. I excused out. Remember we talked about excuses? And then I threw out, just to help further justify me a little bit more, well, she had over $200 in the basket, you know, of stuff. Isn't that just like, aren't, how many of y'all are like me like that? Okay, I'm the only heel in the room. Okay, so what does it mean? And, and I'm, I'm not telling this story to be braggadocious and pat myself, pat myself on the back and say, look how good I am. So, you know, I was preparing this sermon, and I'm thinking about, okay, I gotta be, I've got to be aware of different things around me. And so this week, Beverly uh, picks me up one day because I've got to be out of town that night, and uh, we go over to Longhorn for lunch. And um, we go and sit in the seat where we always sit, and we're kind of tucked away and hidden back there and don't really think anybody sees us. But 
I saw somebody and I waved and all that kind of stuff. And I, I decided to splurge that day. Instead of having some kind of a stupid grilled chicken salad, <laughs> I had some kind of a steak sandwich with onion rings on it and white bread. I didn't go with the fries. I did go with the steamed broccoli. But man, it was so good. It was so good. And then I go to pay. And this girl that waits on us all the time said, Oh, there's no charge day. Somebody already took care of your bill. Man, that was so cool. They're extending. They're, man, they're being light in my life. They're being salt in my life. That was so cool. So I think the bill's like 23 bucks, right? So I figured out, well, we need to tip her, you know, five. I had three $1 bills in my wallet and a 20. I asked Beverly if she had any ones so I could put together a couple ones. Well, you, no, she didn't have any ones. I said, well, do you have a five? No, she didn't have a five. And, you know, it's kind of like the Lord. And I took out that $20 bill. <laughs> And I said, we got blessed. I'm going to bless somebody else. <laughs> now, please understand, I'm, I'm not trying to be braggadocious about that whatsoever. Because sometimes I don't pay that cart bill in front of me. You know? But taking the opportunity to take the risk and to reach out. I started coaching soccer again for the three- and four-year-olds. Bentley, the big brother, he's on the team, man. You should have seen him Friday night kicking that ball all over the place. And my granddaughter, Zoe, told Beverly at the end, I said, I don't know if I got the patience for this. I mean, you know, I got different kids crying. They didn't get enough ball. You know, somebody kicked the ball away from them. and they're, They just stand there and cry. And uh, this one little girl, cute as she could be, she's not quite even four years old. She gets up and she kicks the ball. I'm looking for her. She's back over there sitting in the seat by her mama. And I said, are you going to play? And she holds up her cracker and her juice. <laughs> Break time. You know, extending grace to others, though, Jesus had something to say about that. He said, when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me as well. And the elderly. I don't see anybody elderly in here. Anybody in here claim to be elderly? I had one of our church members tell me, a couple of weeks ago, Pastor, I am the oldest person in the church. I hate to bust a bubble. I had them look it up in ACS. You're not the oldest person in the church anymore. Or somebody's got you beat by five years. So I just want to teach this lesson. There's always somebody older than you, unless you're the oldest, <laughs> that you can bless in the elderly. There's always somebody younger than you that you can bless in the youngerly, if that's a word. But take the risk. And extend grace to other people. Offer a cup of the living water drawn from the well that will never run dry. And when you learn to do that, you become great as salt. And you become bright as light. The Lord Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Live in such a way that you attract others to me. You're the light of the, of the world. You know, you don't light a lamp and put a basket over the top of it, but you set it out on the table so it lights up the whole room. Live your life so as to chase away the darkness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessing of being in worship together here in this room. Lord, thank you for the truth of your word that enlightens our hearts. Lord, I'm amazed and just uh, give you praise over the life of Ron, 
saved and preaching the gospel today out in the Northwest. Lord, we ask you to do that kind of stuff in our hearts and lives. I pray for people this morning that may not know Jesus Christ, that you will have penetrated their heart in some way and draw them to yourself. Lord, I pray for those that are praying about a church to be a part of, that this would be the day that you draw them in. Lord, to you be the glory and the honor and the praise throughout all of eternity, and particularly in these few moments. For it's in Christ we surrender our lives. Amen. Let's stand together. Would you come right now?